I denna episoden av Akkovei Jødepodden får dere møte min fjerne slektning, israelske Shachar Ankori. Shachar fyller snart 24 år og har lagt bak sig to år i den israelske armeen IDF. I denne samtalen forteller hun om livet efter IDF, om sitt syn på staten Israel og om dens manglende konstitution. Vi snakker om det hebraiske språket og om den alltid nærværende holocaust-historien og mye mer. Hi, uh, my name is Shahar. Um, it's a hard name for me to say. I've been practicing for two days now. <laughs> yes. can, can you tell me if I'm saying it the right way now? Sure. Shahar. Shahar. Yeah, I think that's that's very good. Because I've been into chakra. Yeah. Sh- sh- chakra. I've done, I've done all mistakes. <laughs> but now you're leaving me tomorrow. I'm probably close to getting there. Shahar. Yeah, that's very good. Okay. Uh, it's actually the Hebrew meaning of the of dawn, sunrise. The name appeared in the Bible many many times, uh, not as a name but as a description of times of the morning and things that you should do in the morning, and as hope kind of. So that's where the name comes from. It's a very common Israeli name. You don't sound at all Israeli. How come? I actually lived in America for two and a half years when I was a young child. And since then, the language has stuck with me. It's quite fortunate for me too, because then we can easily understand each other. That is, that is very, very true. I love to speak into people from different cultures and countries. So that's always a pleasure. So the reason why we know each other now is actually because you found me. I've been looking for people for many, many years because I wrote this book about my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, whom I didn't know, but I never found you. Actually, I found your grandmother and your great-grandmother, but I didn't find you, but you found me. How yes, how, how how was that? How did you actually find me? Well, um, maybe in the first quarantine during the beginning of COVID, I had a lot of free time to myself after getting discharged from the army. Uh, and I started digging in. At first, I started with my mother's family, trying to figure out some of their Holocaust history, which is something that always, <clears throat> sorry, interested me. And I wanted some answers to a lot of questions that I've had. And so I started to really, really dig into it until I found some parts of my dad's side. And then whilst digging in that side, I also found Nina. And that that's... That's how we got here, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and I did actually meet some of my distant relatives in Israel a couple of years ago, but I never had a visit from anyone. So you are the first one visiting me. And that's that's pretty awesome, as the Americans would say. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> and you just also mentioned that you just finished the army, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. Yes. So tell me a little bit about what that was like. For how long were you there and what did you do? And uh, what is it like ending the IDF? Wow. Uh, actually, I, I've finished it uh, almost two years ago now. Well, I was there for two years and three months. I started as a combat soldier in the search and rescue unit, which specializes in rescuing people from natural disasters like earthquakes and... Um, buildings collapsing in certain situations and I started there and I kind of developed through in that part and it's actually very very hard to get discharged from the army it's not as easy as one would think I mean it's the, for the first time in your life you're on your own you don't have something that you have to do it was also very difficult for me because I felt very very meaningful in the RDF I loved what I did it was very very difficult to go back to this emptiness kind of why did you of why did you like to... it so much i think it gave me a lot of meaning in my life i felt very very important i felt like i was participating in protecting my my family my friends my i felt like i was doing something very that that was bigger than myself do you think that's common is that what people usually f- are, are many people having it, the, the same feelings uh, about it I guess it depends exactly what you do. It depends on the person. I mean, some people don't really 
view it in the same way, but I always did view it in a very patriotic way. But I think most people feel that kind of, it's very difficult to get discharged from the army after you've been so nurtured in that mm. environment and everybody's taking very good care of you mm. and you have a very pretty good support system overall. And uh, once you're done with that, you're, you're a grown up, you're a full adult and you have a lot of experiences mm. behind you. And I think it really matures you. And, but you're still kind of, you feel very, very young but you're the first time in your life, you're on your own. Do you feel much. that the, the army has shaped you to a huge extent? I mean, who, do you think you would have been a totally different person without the uh, army? For sure. The army has matured me so much. It has made me a completely different person. I mean, if you think about it, if you let an 18, 19 year old have so much responsibility over things, and it could be from the smallest job there is to the biggest jobs there are, and, you know, sometimes people get actual responsibilities on intelligence, you know, and protecting soldiers' lives. It's not, it's not, it's not a joke, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a lot of important things. And it, these are, at the end of the day, these are just 18-year-olds who get tremendous responsibilities. But is it too much? Is, this, is the responsibility too big? I don't think so. I think actually quite the opposite. I think in this day and age, a lot of people don't take enough responsibility. So I think just for the fact that I got the responsibility in such a young age made me feel a lot more mature and capable of mm -hmm. achieving great things, even though I was so young. But, you know, there's also these people who would criticize uh, military systems for taking advantage of young people who doesn't know the consequences of their actions, you know, that sending young people to war who doesn't really have a choice or doesn't know the consequences of the whole thing. Yeah. What do you think about that? Um, I think it's always a complicated situation, but I think the army ser service is considered very much of an honor in most places and families. Uh, the combat soldiers are considered our heroes, basically. And that's for better and for worse. I think sometimes it's kind of sad to me that these are my heroes, you know, 18-year-olds mm. who probably didn't really choose what to do, but they're still doing it. Mm. It's interesting, though. You know, we, we said before we started recording this conversation that uh, we would talk about things that interest us, and but it shouldn't be extremely political. And still, we, <laughs> we, we head there immediately. Maybe it's because of me. I'm sorry. But I'm just curious to know if you want to answer that. How do you feel about those young people who refuses to go to the army? I can't judge anyone, but I think there are so many possibilities. And, you know, the army doesn't recruit everyone, obviously. There are a lot of people for that for tremendous reasons can't go to the army and they're released from it. So I think if someone has mental health issues and for some reason cannot participate in the army, that's totally fine. But I think the whole idea of taking like two years of your life and you dedicate it to something that's bigger than you, it could be the country, but it could be other things entirely. And if you do that, I think it gives so much more meaning to your life. There are still some things that are bit bigger than you. And the fact that everybody does that together in the army and you meet all kinds of different people from all over Israel. And as much as Israel is small, it's so different. It's so diverse. And the fact that I got to meet so many different people has been great for me. Mm. So I do think that whoever can't for some reason do the army... I don't like it, but I can understand, you know, mm. I can, uh, I'm not judging. I try not to judge anyone. I know everybody has their own reasons. If it's economic issues or whatever, then I would, I would not be angry personally at anyone. Mm. But obviously I think that if everybody does that, we won't have an army. So I don't think it's very good at the same time. So leaving the army, does that easily make people depressed because they don't have anything to go to i mean you said it's a it's a major change leaving the army for me it was i'm sure not everybody feels the same way but um actually the fact that you get quite a lot of support when you're done is very good and it's not i would i wouldn't call it depressing because everybody kind of looks forward to being done with it already and to be your own person mm-hmm but at the same time, yes, it's pretty, it's it's not easy. It wasn't easy for me, at yeah. least. Um, I can only really speak for myself. But you kind of get a very good support system 
from the government at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, In what way? Good. How do they support? Like financially or? Uh, also financially, you get like quite a lot of money at, for that day and age. Mm. And there are some uh, organizations that kind of help. And if you feel kind of stuck, you can call them and they help you find a job and get into university and just move on with your life to know your rights. Mm-hmm. Um, this is always important. But I think, I hope that for, like, I have a support system at home, but, mm. but I hope that for other people that don't, they still feel the same way. Right. So now you've been traveling and you uh-huh. chose to come to Norway. I have, actually. Um, well, I've been traveling for a little bits and bobs these past two years because of COVID, but now is my second big trip, as we call it. Once we're done with the army, we take a long trip abroad. So this is part two of my trip. Um, first, I was in Africa. I volunteered. Mm-hmm. Volunteered and as what? We helped renovate a school, uh, which was in a terrible condition. We raised funds from Israel and abroad. Mm-hmm. And then we flew over there with our stuff and we brought some local workers that helped renovate it. Uh, an amazing school and was very, very great. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so this is part two. So I'm kind of figuring it out but I think now I'm at a time when I really want to collect as many experiences and cultures as I can so with Scandinavia always very much fascinated me and also I just really wanted to see the northern lights and to see some whales up in the north I said that would be a very good chance to see Norway yeah and you did get to see the northern light and the whales and it did. you went to <laughs> Bergen and you even took the Flomsbom yes I did it was a bit uh Small taste from everything that left uh, very uh, much curiosity for, for, for what's to come. And uh, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And today, what did we do today? Wow, so today we went to the park to see the sculptures. Can you please tell me his name again? Gustav Vigeland. Vigeland. The Frogner Park. park. Yes. Frogner Parken. Yes, and we went up to the view to see the view mm-hmm. from the mountain. From Frognersetren. Yeah. Frognersetren. Yeah, I can make that accent even if I really try. <laughs> it's not in my... I can't do that. And then you tricked me into doing something I wasn't... I didn't know I would do. Yeah, so we went to the sauna and then we dipped in a very, very, very cold water. Mm-hmm. It was amazing and very relaxing. I think I would try to adopt that into my life maybe <laughs> but you won't find that coldness as a mediterranean woman it was very very hard for me to deal with the cold <laughs> but this entire trip was about dealing with the cold which i was not used to it was fun because i think you managed very very well but you you had pain in your feet yeah in the I cold think water my body is not used to that kind <laughs> of cold it's just not <laughs> it's just uh but you did it. go all the way with your head and everything yeah. into that cold water I guess so I'm, I was impressed. So you are 23 years old. You're going to turn 24. You're exactly the age as my daughter. I am. Whom we spoke to yesterday on FaceTime because she's not here in Oslo. She's a student abroad. Uh, so it good to, it's good to have you here in my daughter's room. <laughs> <laughs> she just left me and you came and that's good. Uh, it's making good bridge in my life. Yeah. Today was... January the 12th, the second Wednesday of 2022. And at 12 o'clock, we had the bomb alarm going. I'm not sure, but I think it's something like the second Wednesday of the new year or something like that. Every now and then we have the bomb alarm going, 12 o'clock, in the middle of the day, just to check everything is fine. (laughs) And it was a strange sound, and I didn't really react to it immediately. And then I was thinking about you sitting here in my living room, and how that must be strange to you. So what did you think when you heard the bomb alarm? Uh, I actually did not think it was a bomb alarm because I'm used to something way scarier. Uh, It was actually pretty mild and uh, serene even. I think the bomb alarm in Israel has a very strong context of being very terrifying. What does it sound like in Israel? Well, it's pretty much an up and down uh, kind of sound. It's like, ooh, kind of thing. I remember one time I was sitting in my living room and I heard it and I got so scared and I just jumped and uh, it's it's something that kind of 
makes you react immediately. It's from such a young age where you know that's danger and you run and you take cover. But is it only being, uh, you only hear it when there is an, a danger going on? Or do you, is it also when you're practicing, like just for checking? Oh, they practice it pretty much every year or so, and maybe half a year. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you do hear it. But it's, it's, it, you can't help it. I mean, your heart races, your, your body reacts even before you understand what's going on. You know that something's wrong. So yeah, it's, it's always not, not fun to hear it. <laughs> how, how many times have you heard it? Wow, I can't even remember. Countless, countless of times. So every year, every month? No, no, not something like that. But I've heard it pretty much a lot. I, of course, it depends if there is a war or something. Mm. Um, I remember going to the army and one time during one of the bigger operations in, in Gaza. And I remember just getting stuck in the middle of the train because uh, there was a bomb going on. And uh, so, yeah, it's something that happens. Do you have a shelter in your home? Yes, of course. Every house has a shelter, pretty much. The oldest ones, they stay at the uh, staircase. Mm -hmm. But pretty much every new home has a shelter inside. Uh, it's something that you have to, it's regulated. I mean, you have to have a bomb shelter in your and house. And wh what defines a shelter room? What's special about that room? It's pretty much a bunker. It's made out of thick concrete. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but pretty much it's something that you can close with a steel door. And uh, it has like one window, but it's with glass that's like bomb proof. And uh, yeah, it's pretty small. It's very... And is it food in there? Uh, it depends on the families. I mean, some families keep food in there, some don't. It depends. You don't have to. Sometimes it's a bedroom, but you have to have it in a house. I mean, it's... Uh... And do everybody have a gas mask? No, you don't really have to. Um, there was a time maybe at, when there was fear from uh, Saddam Hussein back then. I think mm -hmm. it was 2005. Then we had like gas masks, but rarely we do. It's only at times of need, then we take them out. Uh, but usually you don't because they're not nuclear. They're not anything. They're not chemical. Uh, it's just bombs. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And also we, you, to, you told me about that you have this alarm app and that you have these news apps. Tell me a little bit about your relation to your phone and what, how, yeah. uh, what part that plays in your life. Most of the people I know would have uh, a news app on their phone that's always on and it always says what's going on within the Israeli people <laughs> it could be political it could be I think most most teenagers and most young adults in Israel are very very much aware politically more than I've seen in any other country to be mm. honest mm. they are pretty sure what their political stance is and they're pretty sure what they believe in so yeah it's it's also a survival defense thing but I think it's also about po politics so that's the news app I think everyone has it pretty much except the people that are completely oblivion to it but on the other hand yeah the the bomb alarm app I actually don't have it I deleted it recently because it just kind of scared me mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah it's something that I would get when there is a huge uh, operation coming And so I would download it to see what's going on in the country, to be involved. It's mm. something of solidarity, but it's also just so you know, like if I'm staying in my house, my house is like maybe four hours away from Gaza, maybe less even, like two, and, no, it's actually like two and a half hours, I think, uh, from the northest part of Gaza. And so I wouldn't be, I would probably stay clear of the, all the drama, but you know, it, they could. Mm -hmm. technically so yeah so just to know what's going on if it's near my house if it's near my friends it's pretty much to stay aware so did you feel that the alarm app decreased your life quality or why did you actually choose um, to take it away i do believe that staying too involved within the news and the bomb alarms and it's very tiring on your on your soul it's not very good for you uh it just keeps uh, the stress levels very high mm -hmm. i mean i just realized this after a few days of being here that i kept receiving all these notifications about things going on in israel and i just turned it off i realized it was way too much and i realized whatever i need to know i will know anyway so there's not really much point but yeah i just uh i happened to just realize that there was uh, a, tr a trial for a terrorist attack where my grandparents live like pretty close i realized that a few hours ago And uh, I didn't know about it. And that's when, you know, 
you realize you kind of need those apps. <laughs> you mm. want to know what's going on. So it's always that in between. So when you say that most young people are, you know, they have opinions, they participate in in the debates, do you also feel that there's a lot of, that they mostly agree or is there a lot of disagreements? Oh, tons of di disagreements, actually. I think none of us completely agree on anything, <laughs> to be honest. After um, all, we're all Jewish. <laughs> yeah, all Jewish, very Jewish, actually. So no, I think I think we mostly don't agree. But yeah, it takes two Jews to have three different opinions, right? So I think that's that's very much it. So traveling, being a young Israeli woman like you, yeah, having lots of opinions, you're young, you're still, and still you have so much experience. Sometimes when I listen to you, I can almost hear that you're kind of exhausted from your life <laughs> and still very hungry for more life. I yeah. mean, there's 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 no doubt. I think that growing up in Israel is pretty different from most other countries. I mean, I think your, your, your childhood and your youth is different from most Norwegian young people. So coming here and coming from Israel, has people, do you have to defend something? How, do you, how are you being met? Oh, yeah, I think that's so true. <laughs> I think yeah. that's the best way to describe it. I think that many people, uh, it's kind of been talked about, that a lot of people going on their big trip after the army, even if they're completely left-winged, they believe in a two-state two solution, you know, they're, they completely agree with Palestinian rights, but as soon as they get out of the Israel boundaries, they feel like they need to really defend Israel and what it stands for. And I think that's very interesting because it's always been kind of, a, you know, a survival's thing that you need to protect whatever you have even if you don't completely agree i don't think everybody completely agrees with the government's choices you know but at the same time it's very interesting but as an israeli woman and i think about as an israeli person it's very much about that when you go outside and you try to defend what's your own mm -hmm. and not even if you're necessarily back home would have said the exact same things or would have viewed the things exactly the same way but are you sad. are you met with curiosity or with hostility Wow, I think it very much depends. Uh, so far, I've met pretty nice people from mm -hmm. all over. Uh, they could be Muslim and Christians and whatever, basically. Mm -hmm. Buddhist. And I've met people that didn't like Israelis. But I think I managed with a lot of tolerance to make them understand my point of view. And I think the main thing that we all need to remember is that we are all human, you know? Mm. Most people, they want the most simple things. We want health, we want happiness, we want to live well our lives, you know? And I think it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Muslim at, at that point. I think it just... And that's the thing I've noticed over and over and over again. In, in Africa, I've noticed that. I've noticed that in, in Sri Lanka when I visited. I noticed that pretty much everywhere. Europe, it doesn't matter. I mean, the... At the end of the day, unless you're a very radical person that believes that Israel shouldn't exist and that Jewish people are terrible and they're anti-Semitic or stuff like that, I don't think I actually met like such hostility as you would have thought. But at the same time, I wouldn't be keen to share that I'm Jewish to someone that may look like they're not very nice. Mm -hmm. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. So I think it's always like that. Some people would rather not say that they're from Israel. Mm. They would rather stay out of the conflict. But I think that's a mistake. And I think I should not need to apologize for the fact that I'm Israeli or Jewish. If anyone has something to say, then they're more than welcome to talk to me about it and to make an agreement. It's kind of funny, but someone one, maybe a year ago told me that it's kind of weird how in Israel you're kind of groomed to go to the army since a very, very young age. I mean, from your, since the time you're around 16 or even before, you start getting into the tests before the army so they can decide your job and what your preferences are. So from that pretty much, even before, you work out to get to the army to a good position if you want to be super combat and, uh, you know... Uh, as we call that which is the commando um, is that the most prestigious there are a few there are a few very so you ones. were had a prestigious position in the army when you were there no i didn't have such a prestigious position but you said you were like in the combat thing 
Yeah, but it's like, okay, so it's very, it's very complicated to explain, but some <laughs> units are very special units. I okay. Think, uh, maybe uh, they're not very popular because it's very hard to get in. But, but doesn't that few... make it popular if it's hard to come in? Isn't that kind of elitistic within the army system? Well, obviously there are units that are considered better than other others, for sure. So intelligence units are considered very, very good. They're not combat usually. They're considered like if you're very smart and technological and you know, you're good with computers or languages and you go there and you come out with a great job afterwards. So it's very, very valued. Um, you could be combat, you could be like a regular combat soldier, you could be a special units, which is also very good. So what I did is kind of uh, an in-between. I wasn't actually combat in the end because I had a, I have a back injury from the army. Yeah, so it's kind of like a mix between being a combat soldier and search and rescue, which I think in itself is a very interesting point of view because on one hand, you're kind of... Obviously, it's both protecting, right? Mm -hmm. But I think in one hand, you could take a life and the other, you're obviously rescuing people. Mm -hmm. I think being in that situation is very very interesting on its own and like why would you rescue like how does that live together and i think it's i think that's exactly it it's realizing that it's not just about killing people it's not about that being combat it's about protecting uh that's why it's called the idf the defense force and not the attack force and i think yeah so since you're pretty much maybe 16 or something, you get tryouts for the army. Mm. And since then, that's what you have in mind to get to a good job and to continue your life. If you're an officer in the army, it's considered a huge honor. And it's considered like you would be maybe better, like the high quality kind of thing. So because you started out saying that from an early childhood, you're groomed into this. Very much. So grooming like that, isn't that close to brainwashing? Obviously. I mean, yes, I, I had a time when I was very, very critical about that. And I think as well as sometimes way too militaristic for me. But at the same time, I think there's so much good to it. But I, yes, I, I'm, I completely understand. I don't really have anything to say about that, except obviously sometimes I would wonder if I didn't live in a country like that, what would I think? It's very, very difficult on one hand. But at the same time, it's also very... Uh, it's very interesting to live in a country like that. So I was actually wondering, you as a young Israeli Jewish woman, of course, how do you look upon Jews in Europe and in the United States? I think they are very important to how Israel is viewed. And I think it's very, very good that we have Jewish people living outside of Israel. I think if Israel remains very closed with all Jews and no Jews living abroad, it's not good. Because I think once you meet local people and you represent different opinions, I think in bringing sometimes the Israeli point of view and the Jewish point of view, it's so important to understanding each other. Yeah, obviously I would want everyone to have a connection to Israel. Uh, if people want to move to Israel, I think that's amazing on its own. But I also very much value them for living abroad and still keeping their Jewish identity and relations to Israel. So what would, I never actually had that thought experience. What would happen to Judaism if all Jews in the world lived in Israel? I mean, it would be very crowded, of course, in Israel. <laughs> very much. <laughs> About half of the world's Jews today lives in Israel. And many lives in America, and then there are some other Jews spread around the world, but most of yeah. them are in the States and in, in Israel. It's, it's interesting with those figures because, you know, before the war, there were about 12 million Jews in Europe and half of them were killed. Yeah. And today there are a little bit more than 1 million. And sometimes when I hold speeches myself, I do this thought experiment that if all those 12 million you know, if none of them were killed and we would have the same increase in population amongst the Jewish Jews people, Jewish people in Europe as the rest, there should have been probably like 20, 25 million Jews in Europe today. Yeah. And there is 1 million. You know, that's a very, it's an interesting thought, right? Yeah. So all the people that should have been here are not here. Either they were never born because their ancestors were killed 
or they moved after the war. Those few yeah. that were left, they they chose to to move to Israel, Palestine, or to America. And sometimes I have the feeling that Israelis are kind of angry with Jews outside Israel because we don't participate in the conflict. Maybe we aren't loyal enough to the conflict and that we could always come to Israel if that Israel <laughs> would be like a kind of a life insurance. I think there's truth to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very much. Um, I think it's mostly when Jewish people that have never come to Israel make criti like criticize Israel for what it does. I think the problem is, and I think we discussed it before, is that I think we need to understand that the European point of view about Israel is very, very different from the Middle Eastern point of view. And that how Europeans, after generations after generations of understanding what are states and what are territorial boundaries, they're not the same thing in the Middle East. And I think coming to political things, I think it's not actually very, very good. And so that's highly criticized within the Israeli population if they hear someone criticize that without actually being here and understanding their inner politics and how complicated it is and how the lifelong is i mean i see you know arab people every day you know and sometimes would we'll say yeah you put them and you cause apartheid and so at the end of the day we experience things very differently if they stand with israel then it would have been completely great but mm. if they don't then that's very criticized <laughs> yeah Yeah, I, I find what you're saying about that very interesting. To me, of course, being grown up in a in a state which is very defined, even though we were used to be ruled by other countries as well, and we're a quite young nation, Norway. Every democratic state, as far as I understand, what defines a state is the constitution, you know, the yeah. laws. And the laws are made to work within a special territory. And if you have an egalitarian or equal society that law should be equal to everybody. Uh, so for me, it's hard to understand how you can have individual rights without everybody e being equal to the law and the law being applied within a defined geographical area. But what you're talking about, so I think this is probably a point where we won't really agree. Uh, but I think it's interesting to listen to you because it, If I understand you correctly, you're talking about that in the Middle East, those borders are made by earlier colonial powers, like, you know, the Great Britain and the French and everybody. So my question would be, would that solve any problem if those borders and nations weren't defined? I mean, how how have they actually increased the conflicts? In well, I think, first of all, European people are very much influenced by how they relate to the country they live in and their nationality. And the thing is, is that in the Middle East, it's very much not like that. People very much relate to their religion much more than their, to their own country. And we talked about this before, but I think, I don't know how it would solve things differently because it's, it's history. Things could have taken place in a very different directions, but I think that's what will happen at some point, especially in Syria and Lebanon, where it's, tons of different religions within two small states that are very much corrupt and have very, very, very bad ruling skills. So I do believe that that's what's bound to happen anyway. We saw that in ISIS, by the way. I think that's the greatest example. I mean, there's a few group of people, you know, a group of people that said, like, we want a Muslim state and this from this side to that side. And it doesn't. It didn't matter what their nationalities were. If you're not Muslim, we will kill you. Mm. Like if you're not Sunni, mm. we will kill you. So I think that's one of the biggest things that we should understand, and European people should understand. It's it's just not the same thing as it is. You know, it, it's not the same thing as even Israel in itself. You know, it it has defined boundaries, but Israel is highly influenced by Europe and by America. And so Israel in itself, I'm leaving the West Bank and like a different subject, but the Israel itself has very much, very clear boundaries. But by the way, Israel does not have a constitution. Israel does not have that. It, has it does a, not have a constitution? No, Israel doesn't have by law a constitution because there's so many disagreements on it that it was never made. And there's always like a committee that's supposed to make a constitution, but it was actually never made. What Israel does have... So you have, have a lot of laws, but you don't have a constitution that, that's, exactly. that's like the higher laws. 
So there are types of laws, and they're not considered a constitution. They're considered as basic laws. They were made around the time that Israel was uh, a very, very new state, pretty much back in 48 and in the 50s. Some of them get uh, uh, that kind of level of, you know, importance and higher levels, but not, not as much as they used to. And that's pretty much it. We don't have a constitution. And I think that's one of the biggest issues is that because we can't agree enough. Actually, I feel really have. stupid now. So what defines the constitution? The, con- the constitution defines the nation, doesn't it? It's like the, it's like those kind, it's the, the, the elementary laws that kinds of build the nation, isn't it? Kind of, yes. And it's the laws that, I mean, to you would have laws or regulations. How to change the constitution would take a huge majority of the parliament, right? Yes. Whereas other laws could more easily be changed if it's not a part of the constitution. So that's probably how you define a constitution. I'm really not sure. I feel so ignorant. I should know. I'm, I could be your mom. I should tell you. <laughs> I should be able to tell you this. But well, I, 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 you know, it's, it, it's just very interesting that suddenly... Uh, I didn't know that Israel didn't have a constitution. And yes. of course, because all of those Jews that can't... <laughs> All of those, all of us Jews that can't agree upon, you know, difficult things or easy things. Of course, it's hard for, for us to make a constitution. Yeah. <laughs> But then again, I guess also it's a consequence of political issues. You know, what was Israel at, at the time? Maybe the constitution was supposed to be made later on when things had calmed down. Yeah, that, that was the main idea. The status quo was then invented. Uh, which sustains mostly religious laws, actually. And, well, for example, how public transportation wouldn't work on Saturdays in certain areas unless the Jewish population is very slim. It doesn't just to calm down the ultra-Orthodox people that really, they don't want the public transportation to work. So that's just an example. Or the status of the um, marriage laws are very much influenced by Jewish laws. But that's family law. I mean, that wouldn't be a part of the constitution in Norway either, but the constitution would regulate who can vote. So that's been said in those laws that I've told you about, the basic laws as we refer mm. to them. Mm. And it's like fundamental laws, which states that Israel is a democratic and Jewish state, that uh, everybody should treat, be treated equally, no matter gender or sex or, you know, religion. religion. Actually, that makes me think about something else we talked about today, yeah. which is linguistics. Because we talked about the woke thing, you know, and all the gender issues, were, which has been, you know, on the agenda for many, many years already. And Tel Aviv is one, is probably the only city in the Middle East where you can be freely gay, uh, at least to a much, much higher extent than any, any other country or or probably city in the Middle East, as I just said. So, and then we were talking about, or you were focusing on the problems in the Hebrew, the Ivrit, the Hebrew language, uh, when it comes to gender issues. So tell me yeah. a little bit about that. That was so interesting. Well, so the Hebrew language is pretty much, con- it's constructed by female and male linguists. So you would talk to a female or a male in a different way and everything is fem- masculine or feminine so let's say a table is shulchan and a shulchan is um, masculine so you would refer to it in a masculine way so in that sense if someone is gender or non-binary it's very difficult to find a way to speak to them in a way that doesn't offend them because there's pretty much no such thing it hasn't been invented yet so what actually people suggested is sometimes refer to them as female and sometimes as male Uh, to maybe ease it off a bit, but it's very, very, very difficult because the Israeli language, the Hebrew language, is not built in that way. And then you try to try it the plural way to talk to people yeah. that doesn't have a defined gender in a plural word version, but that is not possible either because... Yeah, because the plural version also has masculinity and femininity. So it's it's very, very hard to to differentize that. Yeah. And what has this resulted within in the Israeli debates? I mean, 
I think it's quite new within the Israeli debate. I think the funny thing is, is that everything arrives to Israel at some point, but it's very many years after it started in the US, for example. So if the Me Too movement started, it was talked about in Israel, but it hasn't really gotten that much high until maybe two years ago or something like that, when it actually started to be more talked about. So I don't think it has really reached its full extension in Israel yet. But I think it will mm-hmm. with at some point, maybe in two years or so. And that would be a very interesting discussion because I don't see quite a solution to it, the problem unless we invent something completely new. In your language. Yeah. Yeah. And language is important because it, it influences how we think in, in a way who we are. Yeah, very much. I'm sure it's very difficult for people that see themselves as non-binary. Yeah. I think they would need to... <laughs> It's very, very hard to live in Israel if you're non-binary. Yeah. The language is so... It's in depth, de- deeply, like, differentiated between male and female. We also have masculine and feminine, and then we have something which is uh, in the chen, which is neither. Oh, that's good. Yeah, and then what we have done... I don't know if people like it or not, but we have he and she... And then in Norwegian, that's hun and hun. And then we have made hen, which oh. is neither, which is something, you know, transgender or non-binary or, yeah. Probably people with the gender crossing issues has been there since the morning, but they haven't been acknowledged the way they are today. Yeah. So this is, uh, it's, yeah, it's new issues and it's, it's a challenge to do that within an old language. Yeah, I guess so. And I think it's, I, I don't think, I don't view it as in the same way as maybe gay people. I think it's not actually as old, uh, the gender neutral thing. I think it's actually pretty new because as you can see, even evolutionarily, they had to be like female or male, you know, in order to reproduce and make children. But actually gay people were in animals even. It, it was very very old so i think the whole idea of gender neutral thing i think that's actually pretty new i don't think it's like being gay if you don't have a defined gender how are you met in the idf well first of all we have a lot of chance genders that are now reintroduced to the army uh for a long time i don't think they were able to serve and now they can also in combat positions which is very very good in my opinion so i think i know now that they do have different uh They sleep in different rooms. They have their own room. Uh, I know they have different uh, just private showers uh, just so they would feel more comfortable around other people. Um, but yeah, gay people serve in the army just like everyone else, you know. And uh, now so do transgenders. So I think that's very, very good. Mm. It's usually people that have not gone through the entire process and then Like, they view themselves emotionally as one gender, but sometimes physically they look still like their their old gender. So uh, just, just, just to not create this discomfort for them to be... Sh- because, you know, when you shower in the army, you shower with everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think just to limit that point of embarrassment for them, they would get their own time. Mm-hmm. I know because my boyfriend had, like... three uh transgender soldiers under him he was in charge for them and i know that from him that they had their special time and they were treated with a lot of respect that's what i know okay good good to hear yeah yeah i'm pretty amazed i must say how i'm sure there's a lot of conflicts every as everywhere else it's probably conflicts in the idf and especially i know there is in the israeli society <laughs> I mean, it's uh, highly dramatic all the time. Uh, you live yeah. in a dramatic world. Um, it is, and I think sometimes that's why we take so many trips abroad to kind of chill from mm. all of that. And I think it's also a thing where you don't want to meet Israelis abroad sometimes. Uh, I haven't met any Israeli since I came here, which was the strangest thing, because usually you do. And I thought I would be quite happy about it. I thought it would be a refreshment, but it actually was very hard To mm. not see any Israeli. Why? Well, it's it's kind of funny, but it's kind of your home away from home kind of thing where you see someone that's that gets you. It's kind of like what you said about being with Jewish friends. Right. They understand you. They know what you've gone through. 
and it's always a conversation about oh where where are you from oh i know that person and they know you're like you you always have something in common especially in a state so small as israel mm. and it's always about like where where you were you in the army oh yeah i know that person or i mean we i think we both agree upon that there are no country in the world that has the diversity that israel does Which yeah. makes it is is one of the reasons why it makes it one of the most interesting countries in the world as well. I think anthropologically speaking, I'm sure, mm. and I would love to know what would, what it would look like maybe in a hundred years or so. One of the things is being a third generation to the Holocaust, and I actually spoke about this with a psychologist that said that maybe there is a part of me that refuses to forget people mm -hmm. because. I'm very, very scared of, of being forgotten in my life, I think, because, you know, so many of my, my grandma's family have disappeared and no one knew of them or what they loved to do and what was their nickname or how they even looked like. I was so excited to see how my great-grandmother looked like. It was so impressive to me that I could actually look at her picture. That's like she's me at, this, at, at some level, you know? she's me yeah. I'm her you know we share the same DNA that's that's just it's mind-blowing to me and I think because of the Holocaust you know they say that some traumas pass through generations and actually third generation to the Holocaust suffer from a lot of traumas because of the Holocaust even they didn't actually go through anything at all I think that's what got me into genealogy in the first place and that curiosity of wanting to know even though I was told that we shouldn't dwell in them, those things because they're sad. And yeah, why am I so young and doing this? I'm kind of a heavy soul, I think. <laughs> I have a lot of thinking in my mind and uh, I think about a lot of things and I think that's what kind of started it just the seeing and realizing and it's kind of like a puzzle that you put together and that's yeah. always so interesting yeah i don't think you're a heavy soul i think you're a serious soul very much so and i know that you would like to go to law school and um, i would yeah you're a young woman you're you have a lot of experiences that norwegians don't have old or young you amaze me you know with your you. knowledge your analysis your Your thoughts. Uh, we differ probably in some for sure <laughs> some places, but it's been, it's been so help so teaching for me to talk to you. And I think when you know I share the genealogy interest, of course I do. I even wrote a book about my my unknown grandmother who was the sister of your great great grandmother or something. Yeah, <laughs> there's a generation jump here between your family and my family. And yesterday we went through old files that I found through my research and I've shared them with you. And you saw probably for the first time the picture of uh, Josef Heller, Chaim Josef Heller. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, for some reason, maybe because uh, actually my great grandmother moved to Israel and she died in Israel. So I had a bit more of a connection to her whilst he died in Belgium and I've never heard of him. Um, I think it was pretty strange because he's me too. <laughs> yeah. And it was pretty interesting because, you know, all of my cousins, we all share the same big eyes thing. You know, we all share kind of like the same eye shape. Yeah. And I always thought it was from my grandpa's side, the Tunisian one, because I'm one quarter Tunisian. <gasps> I always thought it was from that side. But then when I saw pictures of Margaret, my great grandmother, I was like, wait, maybe it's from her, actually, which yeah. is kind of, it's amazing. I mean, I'm a bit of Polish, I'm Slovakian, like, whoa, what's that like? I'm Tunisian, I'm Israeli, I, I think trying to connect all these parts of me and realizing I'm neither, but I'm also all of them at the same time. But you're, I mean, I'm the generation before you, and... Sometimes when I hold my lectures, I will try to explain to Norwegian people. I will use a word which is a very humiliating or a bad word. But sometimes I feel I need to use that word in order to define myself. And I try to explain to them what it's like being a Holocaust junkie. <laughs> I sometimes I feel like a Holocaust junkie. If I don't read a book or see a film or if I don't talk to anybody about the Holocaust for a month or so... I'll feel really, really bad. I need that kind of uh, 
emotional connection, emotional adrenaline, whatever, um, it's become such a big part of me. And, and if I don't have, you know, every now and then a new portion, I, I get the abstinence, you know? Yeah. It's terrible. And at the same time, it's also something that I've just come to terms with. And there's also, to me, something valuable into that. But you being the next generation and also hearing you talking about your generation in Israel, where many people don't want to look back, of course, they want to look forward. And and still, though, also the Holocaust is still so important for the state of Israel and the identity of the country and the narrative of the country so okay your thoughts I guess I'm asking your thoughts about the interest of the holocaust the genealogy how important is that to the future of Israel wow uh, I actually think it's getting less and less valid I think because it's been so many years and sadly holocaust survivors are limiting numbers as we speak and um, I think if you're not well I'm third generation as well so I think it's very different uh, for me than it is to other people my age who are fourth or maybe even fifth so to a lot of people it's not actually felt in the everyday life you know you live your life it's pretty simple and then you remember the holocaust maybe at the memorial day when the siren goes on and you stand for a minute and you pay respect, it's very much felt in schools. Uh, I think the Poland trip that we take is very vital to remembering the Holocaust. I know that to me it was an incredible, incredible experience as a young woman. And I think it is so important because, well, I also kind of don't understand that, but I do at the same time. I mean, a lot of people do move to Germany, for example. But I re I can't rem stop thinking about my mom telling me that my grandmother refused to ever set foot in Germany again. And it's not against Germany in person, right? It's It could be any other country. I think a lot of countries were anti-Semitic at that time and, and still are, by the way. Uh, so I think if we do forget this narrative, it could be very dangerous to the state of Israel. I think we should hold on to it, still move forward, still can strive to be a better community to everyone and try to be a better state. But at the same time, also remembering that it's... Uh, so Anti-Semitism, sadly, I don't think will go away. Not quite so easily. I think if we lose sight of what might happen if we don't stay protected. And that's very important to the narrative of Israel. Mm -hmm. If we kind of lose sight of that, I think it could be very much fatal. And I think often people do, especially in my generation and maybe in the next ones as well. So they, they very much, like I always remind myself that my grandmother felt so good to come to Israel. And she was very Zionist even before the war. And I always remind myself how lucky I am that I live in Israel. I mean, my great grandparents would have given everything to, to be in the same situation I am. Whether you like the army or not, at least I guess it creates a common identity that you, you have something to fight for together. So I, I, I just can imagine that being young in Israel is different than most other countries. It's I think it's very much different. And in what way, I mean, whether you like or hate Israel, what is actually positive about this? Are people as lonely in Israel as in Norway? Well, I think people are people everywhere, you know? They yeah. might be lonely in Israel because of someone bullying you, you know? It could be from tons of different reasons. And I think it's not just about having something to fight for in the army. I think it's about having something in common. Even if you hated the army, yeah. right? Some yeah. people hate it. It's not for them. But if you walk around and then you see someone, you're just like, oh, where were you in the army? You know, and everybody knows someone that was in the army because you were in the army yeah. and your friends were in the army. I think that's something that everybody holds in common. So that's kind of like a thing. A uh, common reference. Yeah. But I think that's something that we all share, you know, having that experience. I don't know if people are less or more lonely. Yeah. And also because you're kind of forced out of your shell 
and when you're 18, I think it's very healthy for young children to not stay within their computers, even though they may really want to. So what I try to turn into something positive, I'm ending up with something sounds very heavy though, because I was going to ask, so are there lesser amount of suicides in Israel than in Norway? You know, but probably yeah. you don't know because you don't know how the rates in Norway. And maybe I know that in Scandinavia, it's pretty, it's considered very high. Also because in Judaism, it's not allowed to commit suicide, right? So right. I think some people are influenced by it, but it's not very much talked about because they don't want to encourage it. Religiously, it's not allowed. You know, it, it sounds... It's, it's strange crazy. in Norway, in, in Norwegian, you know, you're not allowed to commit suicide. Okay, so who are you going to punish? Yeah. But it's a religious thing and you don't do that because that's a crime against God, God's creation, right? If God gave you life, you're not Cherish the one it. to take it away. Yeah. But, but yes, I think it has increased during COVID. It has been a little bit of talks about people like veterans that have committed suicide because of things they've seen in war or so it's talked about but it's not so common okay dear Sahra. <laughs> okay i'm gonna have to say this again sha sha that's it's the sh i have to start with a sha shahar 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 i have to remember it start with a sh shahar shahar don't you have sh in norwegian we do you eat with the share, you shatter the bread. We have it all over. Shachad. But we don't have the. <sighs> yeah. yeah. No one does. So, <laughs> dear Shachad, tomorrow you go back home to Israel. I do. What will be the first thing you do when you come home? Probably just hug my mom, my dog. And you'll be back, won't you? Uh, to Nore, for yeah. sure. I think yeah. I, I want to visit during the summer. Yeah, you should. Yeah. You have to. Welcome I back. To. I will. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Tack för att du lytte till Ack och Ivey Jödepodden som är er stöttet av stiftelsen Fritt Ord. Musiken du hörte är er laget av Jens Vendelbo.